Hello again, it's Dr. Armand. Today we're going to start the chapter on electron configuration. So we'll be discussing today how to write electron configuration, how to draw orbital diagrams, uh, also the shorthand electron configuration, and some exceptions involving the D block elements when writing electron configuration. And then part two of this lecture will involve the electron configuration of ions. And what's the difference between pair and diamagnetic species? And then the third part, or the trilogy to this trilogy, the third part of this trilogy would be uh, periodic trends. So those are the three lectures we're going to have covering electron configuration and periodic trends. So we'll go ahead and get started and start discussing electron configuration. So before we begin electron configuration, I just want to recap, do a few examples on what we talked about last week or last lecture involving atomic spectrum and Balmer and Paschen series or the hydrogen atom electron transi electronic transitions. So just to give a few examples or a few, yeah, a few examples of those topics that we discussed in the last lecture. So here we want to know which of the following transitions would emit a blue photon of light. And so what we have to remember from last week or last lecture is that blue photon of light, that means it's in the visible region. And in the visible region, those are the Balmer series transitions in the visible region. The final energy level of a Balmer series transitions is what? That's correct. That's two. So in final, in final equals two for Balmer series transitions. So what we want to do now is look and see which one of the ones have n equal two as a final state. And as you can see, the first one, we have n equal 5 to n equal 1. So that is not a Balmer series transition. That's actually a Lyman series transition. n equals 6 to n equal 3, that is not a Balmer series transition because it doesn't end in n equal 2. So that's a Paschen transition. In C, we have n equal 3, n equal 2. That is a Lyman series transition. So that's one we have to look at. Next, we have n equal 4, n equal 1. That is a Lyman series transition, so we don't look at that one. n equal 5 to n equal 2. That is a Balmer series transition. So we're going to take a deeper look at that one. And then finally, n equal 4 to n equal 3. That is a Paschen series, so we don't look at that. So the two we need to investigate are C and E. Now we're looking for a blue photon of light. And blue on the visible spectrum has a short wavelength. Blue light. So blue light has a short wavelength in the visible region, whereas red light, for example, which is the opposite end, has a long wavelength. So the greater the difference in energy levels, the shorter the wavelength.
So what we want to look for is to see which one has the greater difference in energy levels. And that'll tell us which one's going to be blue. So here we have n equal three to n equal two. That has a difference of one. Next we go, we have n equal five to n equal two. That has a difference of three. So the one with the would emit a blue photon of light would be E. E is the correct answer. It would emit a blue photon of light, whereas C would emit a red photon of light. Okay, one more. Here we want to know which photon has the lowest frequency. So if we remember from our equation with frequency and wavelength, lowest frequency equals longest wavelength. So in order to find lowest frequency, we need the longest wavelength uh, present. And so what we need to do is we need to look at which one of the series has the longest wavelength. So we know a uh, Lyman series is UV region. Balmer series is visible region. And Paschen series IR region. So out of these three regions, the one with the longest wavelength is past chin. So we want to look to see which one of the following transitions are in the past chin series. And remember past chin, that's right, it ends in n equal three. So we're looking for the ones that end in n equal three. So A ends in n equal three, that's a past gen series. B ends in n equal one, that is not past gen, so we can mark it off. C ends in n equal two, that is not past gen, we can mark it off. D ends in n equal two, that is not past gen series, we can mark it off. E ends in n equal three, that is past chin, and then F ends in n equal one, that is not past chin. So we narrowed it down to A and E. And since we're looking for the longest wavelength, it equals the smallest difference in energy levels. So the one with the smallest difference in energy level in the past gen series is the one with the longest wavelength. So here this has a difference of one. E has a difference of four. So the one with the smallest difference is A. And so A would be the transition with the longest wavelength because again it's past chin and within past chin it has the smallest energy gap. So that was just kind of a recap on the from the last lecture's topics. Now we're going to get involved in electron configuration. So with electron configuration we have to introduce what's called Pauli's exclusion principle which says no two electrons can have the same set of four quantum numbers. Just like no two people can have the same home address. So this is very important because this allows us to put electrons into orbitals that have opposite spins. Because again, the two electrons 
can now have the same set of four quantum numbers. So for example, we start with a very simple uh, element hydrogen. Hydrogen is, we add an electron into the first energy level and the first energy level just has a 1s orbital. So if we remember from our lectures, 1s and then above that is the second energy level, 2s, 2p, and then so forth. So we start with the 1s because this is the ground, the lowest energy level. And so what this 1s means, it, it helps identify the four quantum numbers. So one tells us the energy level. L is, the S tells us the type of orbital. And since we know the L, we know the M sub L and then M sub S plus a half. It's common, uh, it's, it's common to give the first electron a spin up or plus one half for M sub S. Now if we go to helium, helium has two electrons. So we write it as 1s2. So that 1s2 represents or has in it stored the four quantum numbers for each electron for helium. And so again, they're almost exactly the same, except you'll notice at the end, the electron spin are different so that they don't violate Pauli's exclusion principle. And so if we were to draw this, as an orbital diagram, say this is 1s. So the plus a half is spin up, the bottom half is spin down. So that way they don't violate Pauli's exclusion principle. Now after we've filled up the 1s, we have to go to the 2s. So next we have lithium, which has three electrons, so we put two in the 1s, and one in the 2s. And this represents the quantum numbers for all three electrons. So notice the only difference between the first and second electron is the m sub s value because they're both found on the first energy level. And then one more example carbon which has four electrons or excuse me six electrons so we put two in the s orbital of the one one s orbital and two in the two s orbital and then we put two in the two p orbital and so that contains all of this information about the four quantum numbers so notice that the the only difference between the electrons in the one s orbital is the m sub s value in the 2s orbital is also the m sub s value. And then the last two electrons are in the 2p orbital. And we'll get in how to add electrons into the 2p orbital in just a second. But again, all electrons have to have different set of quantum numbers. They can't violate Pauli's exclusion principle. So what would violate Pauli's exclusion principle is instead of drawing that 1s, if we drew it like this, this would violate Pauli's exclusion principle. So you can't draw with both pointing up. One has to point up, one has to point down. That's how you feel an orbital. So now what are orbital diagrams? So based on the energy level, we have different types of orbitals present. And the way we fill them is based on the off-ball principle. So we talked about Pauli's exclusion principle. No two, uh, no two electrons can have the same set of four quantum numbers. Now we're talking about the off-ball principle, which says we fill the lowest energy levels first before moving to a higher energy level. So again, we start with energy level one, we have the 1s, we go to the second energy level, we have the 2s and the 2p. Notice that the 2p is slightly higher in energy than the 2s. Then we go to the third energy level, we have the 3s, 3p, 
and 3D. So notice the greater the L value in a particular energy level, the higher the energy orbital is. So this is how we fill electrons with electron configuration. We use the off-ball principle. Now in a little while, we'll talk about some exceptions to the off-ball principle. So one way to show the arrangement of electrons in a, uh, for a particular element or ion is to draw the orbital diagram. So the orbital diagram is important because it can help sh illustrate uh, the number of what we call lone electrons in an element or ion. So a lone electron or unpaired electron is when an orbital has only one electron. So if we draw the 1s orbital, uh, that's not good. Oops. So we draw the 1s orbital. So a lone electron would look like this. That's a lone electron or an unpaired electron. So when one electron in a degenerate orbital. When you put another electron, now it's paired electrons. So orbital diagrams are a good way to know which elements have lone electrons. So for the hydrogen, the orbital diagram would look like this. So there's only one electron in the inner the 1s orbital so this would have one lone electron because it's only got one electron in that energy orbital we go to helium now helium we could put the electrons either both pointing up or one pointing up and one pointing down now the, the way you do this is one pointing up and one pointing down so it doesn't violate Pauli's exclusion principle. So this is the correct way to add two electrons into an orbital, one pointing up and the other one pointing down because that doesn't violate Pauli's exclusion principle. And so this one for helium, since it's both paired up, there's zero lone electrons. Now boron has five electrons, so it'd be 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. In the orbital diagram, we put two electrons in the 1s orbital, two electrons in the 2s orbital, and one electron in the 2p. And as general General consensus is that the first electron always gets one pointing up. And you always start with the orbital on the far left when filling the orbitals. So this is what the orbital diagram of boron looks like. And so boron has one lone electron. Now we'll move on to something a little bit heavier, uh, oxygen, which has an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. So it has a total of eight electrons. And so again, for the orbital diagram, we start with the 1s, we completely fill it, the 2s. Now when we get to the 2p, we have four electrons. And so you may say, well, let me just add them like this, put two in the first degenerate orbital and two in the other, but we have to introduce another rule and this is called Hun's rule and Hun's rule states that each degenerate orbital gets one electron before pairing up so the correct way to draw the orbital diagram of oxygen would be to put one electron in each orbital and then you go back and pair it up so that this doesn't violate Hun's rule so we talked about Pauli's exclusion principle no two electrons can have the same set of four quantum numbers. We talked about the off-ball principle. You start with the lowest 
energy level and fill that before moving to the next energy level. And now we talk about Hund's rule that each degenerate orbital gets one electron before you pair it up. And here, oxygen has two lone electrons. And that's important because oxygen's most common charge as an anion is what? That's right, negative two, because it has space to accommodate two more electrons. Next, we have phosphorus, which has 15 electrons. So again, you start with the 1s, you fill it with two, then you go to the 2s and 2p, you completely fill those. Then we go to the 3s, which has two electrons, and then the 3p, which has three. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p3. Again, we're using the off-ball principle, starting from the lowest energy level, working our way up. So the orbital diagram, we have completely filled 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s. Now when we get to the 3p, one electron goes in each orbital like that. So phosphorus has three lone electrons. Again, we have to abide by Hund's rule. And so this is the filling scheme for off-ball principle. Notice we started at 1s. From 1s, we go to 2s. 2s, we go to 2p. And then we go to 3s, of course, 3p. But notice after 3p, we go to the 4s and then 3d. So d comes after the next highest energy level. So 4s, then 3d, then 4p, 5s, 4d10. So see, 5s, then 4d, 5p6, 6s2, and then we introduce the f orbital, 4f14. So make sure you remember how to use this filling scheme because you have to know this in order to fill the electrons correctly. So again, 4s then 3d. So 4s is lower in energy than the 3d orbital. Now there's always some uh, issues with describing this because when the 4s is empty, it's lower in energy than the 3D. But once the electrons are added to the 4S and the 3D, the 4S becomes higher in energy than the 3D once it has electrons in it. But before it has electrons in it, the 4S is lower than the 3D. So there's always some uh, difference of opinion whether you put the 4S or the 3D first. But we're filling them from empty orbitals, so you would do 4s, then the 3d. So for transition metals, again, we start with the 1s, then the 2s, 2p. Notice that on the periodic table from boron to neon, it's six elements. Just like 2p can hold a maximum of six electrons. Sodium, magnesium is two elements, just like 3s. The s orbital can only hold a maximum of two electrons. So once we get to the 3p, next is the 4s, the 3d, the 4p, 5s, 4d, 5p. And so notice that the d orbital is one less than the row it's on.
So for example, if you're on the, if you're at titanium, titanium, that is a D orbital, and since it's on the fourth row, it would be the 3D orbital. And notice, I don't know, maybe you've already noticed it, but from scandium to zinc is 10 electrons. So for example, if we go to iron, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, the last orbital field in iron would be 3D6. So there is some correlation between the filling of energy orbitals and the periodic table. So right here, the actinide, lanthanide and actinide series, these are your F orbitals. Notice they come before the D orbitals. So again, these are the F orbitals. That's where they come in. So let's look at scandium. Scandium has 21 electrons. So again, we start with the 1s, then to the 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p. Notice that the 4s comes first, then the 3d. So its orbital diagram looks like this. So the 1s, 2s completely filled, 2p, 3s, and 3p completely filled. And then we have the 4s, and then the 3d. So the reason the 3d is drawn like this is just for space constraints. You can write them, you should write all five of them out. And so scandium has one lone electron. Next we go to nickel, it has 28 electrons. It's further down the 3D orbital than scandium. So everything is the same as scandium except for the 3D. Now we have 3D8 instead of 3D1 like we had in scandium. So if we go and fill the orbital diagram, it would look like this. Notice that for 3D, every degenerate orbital gets one first before you pair them up. And so nickel has two lone electrons. Again, it's important that you know the off-ball principle. So now there is a good correlation between the periodic table and the uh, filling of electrons for electron configuration. So first off, this region shaded in light blue is called the S block. And so the S block, all elements in the S block end in an S orbital. And the row tells you the last S orbital field. So for rubidium, since it's on the fifth row, the last orbital field is the 5s orbital. And it has one electron in the 5s orbital. For barium, it's on the sixth, energy, sixth row, so the last orbital field is the 6s, and it has two electrons. So these are called s block. Now on the opposite end, Over here we have what's called the P block. 
So all of these elements on the P block end in a P orbital. So the row of the element identifies the last p orbital field. So if your iodine, which is on the fifth row, the last p orbital field would be 5p, and it would have five electrons because if you count from indium to iodine, you count five. Selenium's on the fourth row. The last orbital field is a 4p, and it has four of them. Because you count from gallium to selenium, you count four electrons. Next is big pink block in here. This is called the D block. And so one minus the row identifies the last D orbital field. So if we're on the fourth row and we're looking at manganese, so four minus one is three, that means manganese is a 3D orbital, less one field. If we're looking at niobium, which is on the fifth row, it's going to be 4D orbital. And if you count from yttrium to niobium, you count three, so it'd be 4D3. And then lastly, this purple section over here. is called the F block. And for F block, two minus the row it's on, or period, identifies the last F orbital. field. And so we're going to look at, knowing this, we can actually write what's called a shorthand electron configuration. Because if we know, okay, palladium is on the fifth row, the last orbital field is going to be 4D, and since it's 8 from yttrium, it's going to be 4D8. So it's very important to know the different blocks on the periodic table. So now we look at germanium. This is germanium's electron configuration. As you can tell, it's quite long because it has 32 electrons. But from this, we know that germanium has two lone electrons because it has two electrons in the 4p orbital, which have to be separated according to Hund's rule. So germanium is located here. So everything from 1s2 to 3p6 can be represented by argon. And the reason we chose argon is because it's a noble gas, and noble gases are very stable elements. So everything from 1s2 to 3p6 is the same as argon. So everything after argon is unique for germanium. So what's left? We can write because, it's, again, it's the only unique portion for germanium. And this is called the shorthand. So the shorthand would be the preceding noble gas to germanium, followed by the electron configuration that comes after it. So the 4s2, 3d10, 4p2. And that would be the electron configuration of germanium. Argon, 4s2, 3d10, 4p2. 
we look at fluorine. Fluorine is 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. Since fluorine has 5p electrons, it's going to have one lone electron. Because maximum you can put in the p orbital is six. So it's going to have one lone electron. And so everything from 1s2 is the same as helium. So there's fluorine. Helium represents the 1s2. So everything after 1s2 is unique for fluorine. So we can write helium 2s2 2p5. That's the shorthand configuration of fluorine. Next, we look at iridium, which is a heavier element. You can imagine how long it would take this take to write this electron configuration: 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, 4d10, 5p6, 6x2, 4f14, 5d7. And let's see, it has 5d electrons. Let's see how many, or 7d electrons. Let's see how many lone electrons it has. So that's one, two. Three, four, five. And these are again the 5D. So again, we put one electron in each before we pair it up. So that's one, two, three. Four, five. Now we pair them up. Six, seven. So iridium has three lone electrons. So now back to the electron configuration. Everything from the preceding noble gas. So where's iridium? Iridium is down here on the sixth row. So xenon is the preceding noble gas. So everything from 1s2 to 5p6, because xenon's on the fifth row, the last orbital you feel is 5p, is represented by xenon. So everything that comes after xenon is unique to iridium. So the shorthand electron configuration would be xenon, 6s2, 4f14, 5d7. And that's the shorthand electron configuration of iridium. So now we want to write the shorthand electron configuration of niobium. So niobium is, of course, the element NB. So we want to write the electron configuration of NB. So NB is right here. So what's the preceding noble gas to NB is krypton. So we're going to need to include krypton and then we have what row is this? That's right this is the fifth row. So we're going to have the fifth row we're going to have 5s2 and since it's the fifth row, it's going to be the 4D3. So its electron configuration shorthand would be krypton. And since we're on the fifth row, it's going to be the 5S orbital. And then the, so I'll put it in parentheses for a subscript. And then the 4D, because it's 5 minus 1, 3. Again, I put it in parentheses so that you would know it's going to be a superscript because I can't do superscripts on it. So it's 5s2, 4d3. Again, the preceding noble gas is krypton. After krypton, since we're on the fifth row, this here is the s orbital and it's completely filled. So it's 5s2. And then this here is the d 4d because it's one minus the row. Since we're on the fifth row, it's 4d. Since there's only three electrons, 
we know that niobium has three lone electrons. Because if we were to draw the orbital diagram, so we draw 5s. Five S four D. So now let's draw some electrons. So the five S is completely filled, but the four D we have three. So according to Hans' rule, each one gets one before we pair it up. So it has three lone electrons. Next, we want to know the electron configuration of thallium. So thallium is located <clears throat> on the sixth row. So first off, what's the preceding noble gas to thallium? That's right, it's xenon. So everything up to xenon, we can write as xenon in brackets. So let's go ahead and do that. So that's the preceding noble gas. And then here we're on the sixth period or sixth row. So what does that mean? That means that this is 6s2. And then in here, This is the 4F because it's 2 minus the row it's on. Since it's on row 6, it's going to be the 4F orbital, and it's completely filled. Next, we have next we have the D block. So we have this row here. And since it's on the sixth row, the d orbital would be 5d. So this would be the 5d orbital. Because again, it's on the sixth row. 1 minus 6 minus 1 is 5. So again, that's the 5d orbital. And then lastly, we have one electron. in a p orbital. So the last electron is in a p orbital and it's on the row it's on. So that's going to be 6p. So again the 6s which is over here the 4f 5d are completely filled and then the 6p only has one electron. So it would be 6s2 4f is completely filled, so 4f14 5d10 and then 6p1. And so that is the shorthand electron configuration of thallium. So here's some more examples. So here we have scandium. And what you want to look at is the last completely filled p orbital is going to be the noble gas that you're going to be looking for. So for this scandium, we're looking for the noble gas on the third row, which is argon. So everything from 1s2 to 3p6 can be represented by argon. And so the shorthand configuration is 4s2, 3d1. Next, we go to nickel. Again, nickel, the last completely filled p orbital is 3p, indicating that the last noble, the noble gas that precedes nickel is on the third row, which is argon. 
So everything from 1S2 to 3P6 is represented by argon, and so the shorthand is 4S2, 3D8. Now when we get to cadmium, the last completely filled P orbital on cadmium is 4P. So that tells you the preceding noble gas is on the fourth row, which would be krypton. So everything from 1s2 to 4p represents krypton. So the electron configuration would be krypton 5s2 4d10. And then lastly, hafnium, the last completely filled p orbital, is a 5p. So everything from 1s2 to 5p is represented by xenon. So the electron configuration would be xenon, 6s2, 4s14, 5d2. So there are two exceptions to filling on the off-ball principle, and this is going to be the d-block exceptions. Now there are numerous f-block exceptions, but we're not going to cover those in this course. If you take upper-level chemistry courses, they may touch on that. But for us, we're only interested in the d-block, these two types of d-block exceptions. And these d-block exceptions contain the elements that are 2s electrons and 4d electrons, which is chromium and molybdenum. And so generally, you would write the electron configuration as for chromium 4s2 3d4. However, it's lower in energy to take an electron from the 4s orbital and make the d orbital half filled. And when you do it, do that, it becomes lower in energy. So the correct electron configuration for chromium is 4s1 3d5. And the same goes for molybdenum. It's lower in energy to have a half-filled S and a half-filled D orbital. Now, what would its uh, orbital diagram look like? We'll look at chromium, so we have 4S2. And 3D orbitals. So this is the 4S. And this is for chromium. So we have one electron in the s orbital and five in the d. So chromium and molybdenum have six lone electrons. Now we get to copper, silver, and gold. So these are the ones with 2s electrons and 9d electrons when adhering to the normal off-ball convention. However, it's lower in energy to take an electron from a completely filled s orbital and transfer it to a d orbital to make it completely filled. So a half-filled s and a completely filled d orbital is lower in energy than a completely filled S and a partially filled D. So for copper, it's argon 4S1, 3D10. The same goes for silver and gold. But for gold, I forgot to include right here between the S and the D, it should be 4F14. And the same here for F14. So the 4F should go between the S and the D. And again, these are lower in energy than the corresponding full S and partially filled D. And the electron configure the orbital diagram would look something like this. We'll do copper. Again, these are all degenerate, just hard to draw it freehand. So this is 4s. 
this is 3D. So now we start filling electrons. So we have one in the 4S and 10 in the 3D, which is completely filled. So copper, silver, and gold have one lone electron. So again, make sure you remember this exception. These are exceptions to the off-ball rule <coughs> or the D-block elements. These are the only exceptions we're going to cover. So again, the F block we're not going to cover, and we should just use a normal filling procedure for them. Now, in addition to lone electrons, there are two types of electrons that we talk about when doing electron configuration. And these are outer electrons and valence electrons. So outer electrons are the electrons in the highest energy level. Valence electrons are the electrons that are involved in chemical bonding. And so for main group elements, main group elements, which are your S and P block, Outer electrons and valence electrons are the same. So S and P block, whatever your outer electrons are, is the same as the valence electrons. So for example, if we look at, say, oxygen, helium 2s2 2p4 so oxygen has since 2 is the highest field energy level oxygen has 6 outer electrons and 6 valence electrons So again, main group elements, these are the S and P block elements, outer and valence are the same number. Now for D block elements or your transition metals, outer electrons is the last field, S orbital. So for example, if we look at say iron, which would be argon, argon, 4s2, 2 I believe it's 3D. Six. So iron has two outer electrons because it's the 4s is the highest energy orbital. So iron has two outer electrons. Now for valence electrons for transition metals or D block, it's the sum of the S and D electrons. So again, for transition metals, the valence electrons is the sum of the electrons in the last field S and D orbitals. So for iron, which is 
argon, 4s2, 3d6. It has eight valence electrons. So for main group elements, the outer and valence electrons are the same number. For transition metals, the last field S orbital is your outer electrons, R your outer electrons, the last field D orbital. For valence electrons, the last field S and D orbitals are your valence electrons. So for most transition metals, the outer electrons is are two, except for those exceptions we just talked about in the uh, previous slots. So here we want to know how many lone electrons does nickel have? So let's do the shorthand electron configuration of nickel. And nickel is located here. Actually, let's not do nickel. Let's do cobalt, because we already did nickel earlier. So instead of nickel, let's do cobalt. So we want to know how many lone electrons does cobalt have. And cobalt is located right here. It's located on what row? That's right, on the fourth row. So that's going to be 4s2 and then 3d7. Because again, it's 1 minus the row. And the preceding noble gas is argon. So for cobalt, it's going to be argon, 4s2, 3d7. Now let's do its orbital diagram so you can see the number of lone electrons. So we have 4s and 3d. We have two electrons in the 4s and seven electrons in the 3d. So cobalt has three lone electrons. And just to go a little bit further, it has three lone electrons, two outer electrons, and nine valence electrons. So ruthenium, ruthenium is located right here. And we want to know how many valence, uh, excuse me, how many lone electrons does ruthenium have? So ruthenium is on the fifth row. So again, this is the preceding noble gas is krypton. Then we have the 5s2. And since we're on the fifth row, this is the 4d orbital. So 4d6. Now we write the electron, shorthand electron configuration of ruthenium. It would be krypton. Krypton, 5s2, 4d6. So 
Now, if we were to draw its orbital diagram, so this would be 5s, 4d. So we have two in the 5s, six in the 4d. So we have a total of four lone electrons. So we have four lone electrons, two outer electrons, eight valence electrons. So we have this orbital diagram. We want to know which element has the following orbital diagram. So whenever you're given an orbital diagram, the first thing you want to look at is what's the last field, what's the highest energy orbital field. And that is, you see here, the 5s. So this tells us we're going to be on the fifth row. So we go one, two, three, four, five. So we're on the fifth row because our last field, highest field energy orbital is 5s. Now we want to look at the number of d electrons, because the next highest field energy level is 4d. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we have two 5s electrons and five 4d electrons. So we start here, we go 1, 2, 3, 4, five and so technetium has the following orbital diagram now since it was on the fifth row you can automatically get rid of cobalt manganese because those are on the fourth row and you can get rid of 10 because 10 has last foot orbital is a p orbital so technetium has the following orbital diagram So the last electron in bismuth occupies which orbital? So let's look see where bismuth is. Bismuth is Bi, so it's here. And it's on the, that's right, the sixth row. And it is a P block element. So P block element tells you the last orbital field is a P orbital. Since we're on the sixth row, the last orbital field is 6P. Because again, it's in the P block, it's on the sixth row, so it's the 6P orbital. We want to know next, we have thallium. How many valence electrons does thallium have? So thallium is located right here. We want to know how many valence electrons thallium has. So the preceding noble gas is xenon. So that we know we're going to have to start from xenon and do the rest. So let's write the shorthand electron configuration of thallium. I'm going to start with xenon. Now after xenon, we're on the sixth row. So this right here 
is the S block on the sixth row. So this is the 6S. Oops, that looks like. So that's the 6S. And then we have after the 6S, we have the lanthanide series, which is, since it's an F block series, is 2 minus the row, that would be 4F. And it's completely filled. After that F block, we then have a D block. And since we're on row six, the D block would be one minus the row, which would be five. And this is five D. And then lastly, the last electron is on the sixth row, but it's in the P orbital area in the P block area, so this tells us it's going to be 6P. So now when we write the rest of the electron configuration, we're gonna have 6S2, 4F14, 5D10, 6P1. Now for thallium, which is a main group element, so this is a main group element, This is the main group element, valence electrons equal the number of outer electrons. So here if we look, what's the outer electrons in thallium? So let's look. So the outer and the highest energy level, we have 6P and 6S. So that's a total of three valence electrons. And since it's in group 13, actually all elements in group 13 have three valence electrons. Just a little prequel of what's to come. How many valence electrons does technetium have? And so here, if we look, technetium, where is it? It's on the fifth row in the D block area. It's right here. And so the preceding noble gas is krypton. So we know that we're going to have krypton in the shorthand electron configuration. So we have krypton and then after krypton we have the 5s, the s block on the fifth row is completely filled. So this is the 5s and then after the 5S, since we're on the fifth row, this is the 4D orbital that's filled. Because it's a D block and we have one, two, three, four, five. So this is four D. So the shorthand would be 5S2. 4D5. And since this is a transition metal, for transition metals, valence electrons equals the sum of last field, highest field.
D and S orbitals. So the, the highest field D and S orbitals are the 5S and the 4D. So the number of valence electrons is not. That's how many valence electron, electrons technetium has. Here we want to know how many valence electrons does palladium have. So palladium is further down from technetium. So, so palladium is right here. Again, the preceding noble gas is krypton. So for palladium, again, we're going to be using krypton for the shorthand. It is still on the fifth row. So again, the 5S, the S block on the fifth row is completely filled, which is the 5S. And we also have the D block on the fifth row, which is the 4D, because remember D block, it's one minus the row it's on. And we have a total of eight in the 4D. Again, it's 4D because it's one minus the row you're on. And so there's eight 4D electrons. You count from year to one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The electron configuration would be 5s2, 4d, 8. So again, the number of valence electrons is the sum of the last field s and d orbitals. So valence electrons would equal 10. Oops, spelled that wrong. Valence electrons equals 10. And that brings our lecture about electron configuration to an end. I hope you learned something here, maybe even a little bit. And if you liked the lecture, you learned something new, make sure to press the like button. Uh, for this video. And this concludes electron configuration. The next video, this, the next installment after this will be electron configuration of ions and talking about para and diamagnetic species. So I hope you enjoyed today's lecture. Until next time, I'm signing off.